Hi, I'm Kathy G, and this is my new YouTube channel, History. Hi, I'm Kathy G. Before we begin with today's story, if you like tales from the dark side of humanity about death and the dance macabre, well, you've come to the right place because that's all I do. And I upload at least one video per week and sometimes two or three. So if you're into that, please slap the like button clean into next week and then subscribe to this channel and make sure to turn on the notifications so that you'll know when I've uploaded a new video. I also wanted to take this opportunity to tell you a little more about myself and why you should even listen to me. Well, maybe you shouldn't, but I do have a PhD in anthropology and my specialty areas are forensic anthropology and bioarchaeology. I have analyzed hundreds upon hundreds of skeletons, and I have glimpsed the many ways that life writes your tale in your bones. That's why I'm fascinated by death and the dance macabre. What about you? Why are you drawn to the darkness? Take a moment and let me know in the comments. I'd love to read your story. All right, well, let's get ready for today's tale, a tale of darkness, Death and Vlad the Imperial. Today's story is about a character we're all familiar with. Sometimes he's depicted as seductive, alluring, and, well, just downright hot. Sometimes he's depicted as a hideous monster, as seen here played by Max Schreck in Nosferatu. And sometimes his funny side is revealed. Those fictional depictions are largely based on Bram Stoker's famous novel, which was published in 1897. This is a picture of the original cover. They didn't really focus on cover art for their books, did they? Anyway, none of those fictional characters, even in the bloodiest movies you've seen, comes close to the real life person they were based upon. Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler was born in 1431, and he was likely born in Transylvania, which is in the central region of Romania. But at least one expert, Florian Kurta, professor of medieval history and archaeology, believes that he might have been born in Targovest, which is located in the region of Wallachia. This map shows you the location of Transylvania, which you can see is near Ukraine and Serbia. And this one shows you the location of Wallachia at the end of the 16th century. It basically corresponds to where Bulgaria is located on this map. It's all now part of modern day Romania. Now, Professor Kurta notes that Vlad the Impaler never owned anything in Transylvania, not even the Braun Castle, seen here, which is always depicted in the fictitious stories as the home of Dracula. But by all accounts, Vlad Dracula never even set foot in that castle. Vlad's father, Vlad II, a.k.a. Vlad Dracul, did own a home in Sigishwara, which is in Transylvania. Here you can see a map of the location of Sigishwara relative to the Braun Castle in Romania. Kurt argues, therefore, that it makes more sense that Dracula was born, born in Targovest, since that was actually the location of the royal seat of the Principality of Wallachia when he was born. When Vlad was born, his father became a member of the knightly order known as the Order of the Dragon. And because of that, he was given the surname Dracul, which is derived from the word Drac, meaning dragon. Nowadays, in modern Romania, it just means devil. Well, I guess that's appropriate. Anyway, his son then became Vadra Vlad Dracula. Get it? Vlad Dracula. Now, we don't know who Vlad's mother was. Apparently, Vlad II, Dracul, his father, was a bit of a man whore. He certainly got around since he had several children by his numerous mistresses. Vlad III, a.k.a. Vlad Tepes, a.k.a. Vlad Dracula, would end up marrying a couple of times himself during his life. His first wife's name is unknown, and she died in 1462. His second wife was Ilonia Sili, who was a cousin of the then King of Hungary. 
From his marriages, Vlad Dracula had at least three sons and possibly one daughter. Now, truthfully, the only way you can describe most of Eastern Europe at this time was as a hotbed of conflict. But everyone's big en enemy were the Ottomans. Basically, uh, these were Turkish Muslims. And the role of the Order of the Dragon was to protect Eastern Europe from those nasty Ottoman invaders. This was their cool little patch, so they'd know one another when they ran into each other. They felt they were defending Christianity, and the Order of the Dragon modeled itself after the military orders of the Crusades. We all know how nice the Crusaders were, right? Interestingly enough, Vlad the Impaler and his younger brother Radu were held captive by the Ottomans to ensure his father's loyalty to the ruler, Mehmed II, seen here. During his somewhat luxurious captivity, Vlad Tepes was educated in logic, the Quran, and the Turkish language, which he came to speak fluently. He was also educated in horsemanship and warfare, which would serve him well in the years to come. Vlad resisted the captivity and remained defiant even though he was constantly punished for his bad behavior. Some people believe that those early traumatic experiences might even have shaped his sadistic nature, including his taste for impaling his victims. Vlad's father, meanwhile, continued his warring ways while Vlad was being held in captivity by the Ottomans, and as the saying goes, Live by the sword, die by the sword. Vlad's father and older brother, Mircea II, were both killed. Mircea was actually first blinded with a red-hot poker, a punishment depicted in this Rembrandt painting called The Blinding of Samson. You know, while guns do up the ability of people to kill other people, it's also true that we don't actually need them to engage in barbaric behaviors. Man were a larger, meaner, and better equipped version of the common chimpanzee. And they are mean. Anyway, as if it wasn't enough to blind him with a red-hot poker, Mircea was then buried alive. Soon after the death of Mircea, his father, Vlad Dracul, was also killed. That left only Vlad III Dracula and Vlad the Monk as contenders for their father's throne. Vlad the Monk wasn't interested, but Vlad the Impaler, hmm, he had some ambitions, and he was first installed as the leader of Wallachia in 1448. But a mere two months later, he was forced to flee to Moldova, where he would be trained by his uncle Prince Bogdan II. After Bogdan was assassinated in 1451, Vlad once again fled, but soon re-emerged as the ruler of Wallachia in August of 1456, when he killed his father's usurper, Vladislav II, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Anyway, once Vlad III Dracula was leading Wallachia, well, there's a new sheriff in town and things were going to change. Unlike the somewhat, well, slutty depiction of the Dracula in the movies, Vlad III had a very strict moral code, if you don't count torture, that is, and he was quick to punish any deviation from that in a very sadistic manner. And you know, that's what we're really interested in today. The kind of torture Vlad is named for, impalement, oh my, but that looks uncomfortable, wasn't invented by Vlad the Impaler, but he might just have perfected it. There are actually references to impalement as a form of torture dating back to the 18th century BCE. These come from Babylonia and the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and there were apparently a couple of ways to do it. The picture you see here is of longitudinal impalement, where the victim is impaled along the length of his body. A 17th century merchant who witnessed this described longitudinal impalement in this way. They lay the malefactor, that means the bad guy, upon his belly, with his hands tied behind his back. Then they slint a, slit up his fundament, <laughs> that means his buttocks, with a razor, and throw into it a handful of paste that they have in readiness, which immediately stops the blood. After that, they thrust up into his body a very long stake as big as a man's arm. Ouch! Sharp at the point and tapered, which they grease a little before. Well, isn't that thoughtful? 
when they have driven it in with a mallet till it comes out at his breast or at his head or shoulders, they lift him up and plant this stake very straight in the ground, upon which they leave him so exposed for a day. One day I saw a man upon the pale who was sentenced to continue so for three hours alive, and that he might not die too soon, the stake was not thrust up far enough to come out at any of part of his body, and they also put a stay or rest upon the pale to hinder the weight of his body from making him sink down upon it or the point of it from piercing him through, which would have presently killed him. In this manner he was left for some hours, during which time he spoke, and turning from one side to another, prayed those that passed by to kill him. I'll bet he did. Making a thousand wry mouths and faces, because of the pain he suffered when he stirred himself. But after dinner the Basha sent one to dispatch him, which was easily done by making the point of the stake come out at his breast. And then he was left till next morning when he was taken down, because he stunk horridly. As we shall see, Vlad Dracula used this method, but with a little twist. But before we talk about that, there is another way to impel someone, in case you were wondering. You can also do it via transversal impalement, where basically someone is stabbed through their body. That's what you see in this picture. Boring! Yet another way is with gaunching, which you see here. This was described in the 18th century in the following way. The condemned is hoisted up by means of a rope over a row of sharp metal hooks. He is then released, and depending on how the hooks enter his body, he may survive in the impaled condition for a few days. There's also a gaunching variant, oh boy, in which a large iron hook was fixed on the horizontal crossbar of the gallows and the individual was forced upon this hook, piercing him from the abdomen through his back so that he hung from it, hands, feet, and head downward. On top of the crossbar, the executioner situated himself and performed various tortures on the impaled man below. Oh, what fun. The image you see here depicts another variant of the gaunch method in which hooks were embedded on a scaffold and people were thrown upon them until they evidently de decomposed enough to fall down. And if that isn't enough for you, this image depicts hanging by the ribs. It was painted by William Blake, who abhorred slavery, and it shows this technique in which the poor victim has a meat hook inserted beneath the ribs and then they are hung up to die slowly. Dying slowly was a theme in Vlad Dracula's work as well. He favored longitudinal impalement and would tie each leg of his victim to a horse and then slowly force a stake through the body beginning in the anus or vagina. Another nice touch, he would also make sure the stake wasn't too sharp so that it wouldn't kill the victim too soon. After the person was impaled, he would lift the body upright, and sometimes, as seen in this image of a German woodcutting, he would dine amongst the remains of his dying victims. They would often take hours and sometimes days to die. I think on a scale from dying in your sleep to being eaten by a shark, I would prefer to be eaten over being impaled in this way. If impalement wasn't an option, or, you know, Vlad wasn't in the impaling mood that day, he would also boil and roast his victims alive, and he supposedly arranged their bodies in geometric patterns. He was so sadistic that when he was later imprisoned by the Ottomans, he would continue his ritualistic killing spree on animals like mice and rats that he could find in his cell. I think it's safe to say that Vlad Dracula was a serial killer. Oh, he justified his killing in the name of God or in the heat of battle, but let's face it, he was one sick puppy. His favorite method of killing wasn't just confined to soldiers either. He was terribly concerned about female chastity. This seems to be a common theme among serial killers as well. Anyway, for women who have lost their virginity prior to marriage or who were guilty of adultery or unchaste if they were a widow, he would impale them on a red-hot stake through the hoo-ha, also known as the vagina. He would also sometimes cut off their breasts and force their men to eat the breasts. In case you think he was totally heartless, you should, you should know he also is said to have invited beggars to a fabulous feast. But since he felt they were living off the sweat of others, he would let them eat and afterwards lock the door to the dining hall and set it on fire. At least he granted them one last meal. In this way, he claimed that he had successfully eradicated poverty. 
Talk about spin. Job well done, Vlad. Now you might be wondering what kind of marks impaling would leave in a skeleton. Of course, it's possible there would be sharp force trauma marks like what you see on these ribs. These are cut marks made by a knife of some kind. Or on these neck bones. <laughs> You'll notice there's no skull, by the way. Of course, marks left by a sharp stake being driven through the body would look much larger than these marks. But the way Vlad did impaling, it's also possible there would be no marks on the skeleton at all. Because he would impale his victims very carefully so that they would linger before dying, he would miss vital organs, and also likely most of the skeleton as well. Other methods of impalement, like the transversal impalement, would be more likely to leave evidence of sharp or even blunt force trauma on the parts of the skeleton in the area of impalement. Vlad loved his impalements, too. In one battle against the Sultan Mehmed, Vlad impaled some 20,000 soldiers. As the Sultan advanced on where the battle had taken place, he was greeted by a forest of impaled victims. Oddly, he was impressed and said a man who has done such things was worth much. Hmm. Well, someone like that certainly isn't squeamish, are they? He might even have been a little bit of a serial killer himself. It was in this battle that Vlad's first wife was killed. The Sultan had left after Vlad had retreated to Poyinari Castle, seen here. Vlad had left, but his wife was there, and she is reported to have said she would rather feed the fish of the river Argesh than fall into Turkish hands. With that, the legend goes, she threw herself off the cliff to the river below. That's something that most of the movies delight in recreating. So what finally happened to Vlad? Well, it was a fickle time back then, and he was betrayed by his ally Corvinus, who was the king of Hungary. Corvinus imprisoned him, thereby bringing an end to the battle. But while Corvinus did put him in prison, he just couldn't quite quit that impaler, and actually allowed him to marry his cousin and Vlad's second wife, Elonia Sili, after he had converted to Catholicism, of course. Following that, Vlad would once again briefly retake the throne of Wallachia, but the Turkish army would take it away from him only two short months later. It's not clear how Vlad III Dracula died. Some say it was while fighting the Turks, but others say he was killed by disloyal allies, and still others say he was killed accidentally while hunting by one of his own men. Hmm, that sounds oddly familiar. One of the more colorful stories holds that he was decapitated and his head was sent to Constantinople where it was then preserved in honey and displayed as proof he was dead. While the circumstances of his death and the location of his body are unknown, it is clear that he was dead by January 10th of 1477. The exact location of his body is unknown, but in 1931 archaeologists uncovered a casket that had a purple shroud embroidered with gold at Schnagolf. The skeleton inside of it had a few fragments of a silk garment that were similar to an oil painting of Vlad Dracula, and the casket also had a crown with turquoise stones and a ring, which was also similar to what members of the Order of the Dragon wore, sewn into their sleeves. Perhaps most interesting is that the remains of the casket and skeleton were sent to the History Museum in Bucharest, but they subsequently disappeared without a trace. <laughs> oh, I think we know where they went. Well, that's it for today's video. If you haven't done so already, please slap the like button clean into next week and subscribe to my channel. Be sure to turn on those notifications so you'll know the next time I upload a video. Also, if you're interested in learning more about the dance macabre and the analysis of skeletons, I have put a link to my books in my Archaeology and the Dead series in the description. I've also put a link to my UDEMY course on how to analyze a skeleton. Finally, be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments. I try to respond to all of them, and if you have storyline ideas, that's a great way to let me know. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.